Hi, everyone. I'm going to let all of the people start rolling in. But I'm really, really excited for today. Um, we have a very special guest, like very special guests in plural. We have a whole program that we've been dying to uh, invite and highlight on VMR. This is going to be a new series in GVMR uh, where we uh, talk with international programs about, well, their life, their interests, and a little bit about a little bit about medicine. We always, we always come back to the medicine. Um, so just before we start uh, introducing everybody, uh, we wrote a little bit uh, of something with Brody that I'm gonna read uh, about this new sort of theme GVMRs. Uh, we were really originally created uh, GVMR to reflect on how clinical reasoning is shaped by culture and geographical factors. And we intend, this, um, we intend to get valuable perspective from brilliant communities across the world. As human beings, um, we all have our unique experiences in this chaotic and beautiful life. Uh, and our viewpoints are always molded by um, like clay into a vase. Uh, it's been touched by the melody of what we call our mother tongue by the scent of our favorite childhood sweets, by the kindness of others, and even the suffering of the people we call our own. And the epistemology of our cosmovision always sounds very poetic. Uh, but as physicians, we have this unique and very palpable privilege of exploring humanity in all its grace and its tragedy, and by understanding sort of the philosophy, religion, anthropology, history, and language that shape our patients on our, our own perspective in life, we become better doctors and even more importantly, better people. So this is something that we wanna bring uh, on GVMR. Um, so I'm gonna introduce the team first and then we're gonna introduce uh, Hernan that really doesn't need any introduction. He's been a um, brilliant um, participant in GVMR, but Robbie, do you wanna um, start presenting yourself? Hello, good morning, everybody. It's a delight to be here. Um, I love that. Um, I love that um, very evocative poetry that you have there. Uh, that was beautiful. Um, it's a delight to be here. I'm very, very excited. You can't tell because I have a little bit of a sore throat, so I have to speak very slowly, otherwise it hurts. Wait. Wow. Was I muted that whole time, Maria, or just a little bit? I don't even know. I didn't even touch anything. I don't know how I'm muted. But anyway, the Zoom gods continue to control me. Um, I just wanted to say good morning. It's a delight to be here. Um, I'm, I always get a little bit of a blip in my um, feeling of well-being whenever I'm joining VMR, in part because um, I was telling Rafa this. I think this is my second family. Like this, These are the people who I identify the most with, uh, people who are wonderful human beings and people passionate about medicine like I am. Um, but today the jolt is very strong. I think um, it reminds me of the very beginnings of Global VMR and takes us back to the very uh, existential question for VMR. Why does it, Global VMR, why does it exist? And I think it exists for this very reason to bring people across the world together. And I think you'll see, even despite all our efforts at CPS, we still are very biased and focused towards America being the center of the world. In fact, our most recent episode, a schema episode, was fever in a returning traveler. And guess where, where the patient was returning? The patient was returning to the great United States of America. And we were so focused on how it affects us here. And despite all our efforts, um, even we are flawed in that domain. And um, acknowledging those flaws are very important as we try to uh, as we try to work our, to our ultimate goal of saying when somebody has a fever and returning traveler, they must be returning from Mars or for some for some planet, not to the to the uh, to the world that is the United States. Um, and I love that the next the very next day we're um, we're re we're emphasizing just how global this effort is by bringing on our friends from Chile. And for that, I'll pass the mic to Ernan to introduce himself and his program. Thank you so much, Ravi. I'm so happy to be here and so grateful of Maria Jimena, who was so kind 
to invite us to the session of the CP Solvers. My name is Hernan, I'm from Chile. I live in a city called Concepcion in the southern part of Chile. It's a very beautiful city with beaches and fields. I work as a head of the internal medicine service at La Figueras Hospital and I'm a professor at the University of Concepcion. As you know, my passion outside medicine is music. I play guitar and I sing a little. Uh, last time, Ravi made me, forced me into singing, uh, but now uh, we agree <laughs> that that was too stressful for me. So uh, I have a beautiful family also with my beloved Margarita and my beautiful daughter Isabella that is around here saying hi to the Sepe Solvers family. I'm with my residents and my students also. Uh, is with me Francisca Rivera. She is an internal medicine resident at her second year and is going to be the case presenter today. I also see uh, Jose, um, Jose Pinoza. I see Mitchell Manterola. I see Pablo Lara, Pablo Salgado, Paula Melgarejo. I see also our interns, last year interns, um, saying hi from Chile. So we are very, very happy to be here. It's an honor. Uh, I, uh, I have, I always tend to regret whenever I force anybody to do anything, but I don't regret at all forcing you to sing last time, zero. For those of you who are interested in uh, Hernan's beautiful voice, you should listen to the um, podcast episode, which we I can try to find and put in the chat a little bit later. Uh, wonderful. Well, maybe Francisca, do you mind unmuting and introducing yourself and telling us about you before we jump into the case? Hey, hello, everybody. My name is Francisca. I'm from Concepcion, Chile. As Dr. Carrillo says, I'm a second year internal medicine resident at the University of Concepcion. It's a pleasure to be here. We are really happy for your invitation. But first of all, I would like to apologize myself because it's been a while since the last time I could speak English. So I'm kind of rusty, but I will do my best, okay? Francisca, your English is very, very good, honestly. And the truth is that this is not, um, in English just happens to be the most common denominator amongst people here, but there are many people um, this is a judgment-free zone, truly, and there are many people who can help you translate if uh, you need any translation. Um, I'm curious, I know we're going to do the Q&A, and yeah, I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit more about yourself. What do you do outside medicine? What prompted you to even go into medicine? Okay, well, on my free time, I really like to travel. I like to know different uh, people or different lifestyles. It as I have been studying these seven years and now in the uh, <laughs> residency, I I could I haven't I don't have the opportunity to do it. But also I like to paint. I like to uh, read. I'm kind of a quiet person. Oh gosh, I'm I'm uh, even though I talk so much here, I'm usually silent everywhere else. So I'm uh, <laughs> very very quiet too. Do you have anything that you've painted close by that you can show us? Oh, actually, no, because I'm changing home this week. Oh, <laughs> so my house is empty. <laughs> I have nothing here. Amazing. You could you just taught Hernan a little bit of lesson about how to escape from my um, beggings. <laughs> Hernan uh -huh. could escape from singing, but I clearly have no way of, um, of uh, forcing you to show us a painting. Well, it's a, it's a delight. We'll get to know each other much, much better um, as we go through this case and as we get to reflect on your program a little bit later. But why don't you get us started with presenting the case? And for everybody um, who's listening, we'd love for you um, to participate in the chat and highlight your voice in the chat. So I will come to you um, um, for your thoughts. Alrighty, why don't you take us away, Francis? Okay, so this is a story of a 76 years old man who presents with eight days of constipation, cloudy urine, and anorexia. Oh my gosh, Francisca, I'm not sure if you intended for it to be so dramatic, but it really is. 
eight days of constipation, cloudy urine, anorexia. I think we should stop for just really quickly. And maybe in the next minute or two, I'll see what thoughts are coming in the chat while my dog is whining. All right, y'all, let me know what you're thinking in the chat. This is a very, very important place to stop and reflect. <clears throat> All right, Hans, do you want to share your thought? I think it's wonderful. I haven't come up with anything significant at this point, but when I saw the cloudy urine, I was thinking about a urinary infection, and that can be secondary to uh, constipation. 100%. I think um, you're using the cloudy urine as your anchor, and you're translating that to infection. And you're reminding us that especially in older men, any pressure on their bladder more commonly from the prostate, but also potentially from the rectum can cause stasis and result in infection. I love it. Motaz has a really good thought about uremia. Do you want to unmute and share that thought, Motaz? I don't think yeah. I don't think you're. Yeah, I don't think he's able to unmute. I'm sorry. Hello, hello. Good, oh, good evening. Oh, hello. There you are. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, nice to have an opportunity to share in this uh, conversation today. I am uh, an nephrologist working in one OBD, uh, trying to have uh, a care for uh, such renal patient, and I have a suggestion that constipation may be a sign constipation and cloud urine, maybe a sign of impaired kidney function that can participate uh, in elevation of the, uh, uh, the urea that can have uh, a cause for anorexia, such a presentation for this case. Absolutely superb, my friend. I think that is 100% accurate. Now, where are you calling from? What part of the world? KC. Uh, Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always so nice to hear your voice. Thank you very much. Um, my friend Jane has a really, really good, very anchor thoughts and simplicity. Jane, do you mind sharing those thoughts? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, you know, in the elderly population, you always worry about um, perhaps they have other comorbidities that lead to, you know, them not hydrating themselves, not eating. Um, and that can definitely lead to constipation and UTI, you know, secondary to not hydrating enough and anorexia from the malnutrition. Oh, I absolutely love it. And my friend um, Rodrigue has some thoughts about the prostate. I think that really needs to come up in this case. So uh, Rodrigue, do you want to unmute yourself and tell us more? I'm not sure if um, they're able to unmute, but I will just share that the immediate thought went to the prostate as a common denominator for both urinary issues and actually blocking up the rectum, which I love. Um, no worries at all. Thank you for sharing. Um, all right. So uh, for the sake of time, um, I will say that you've whatever we have here, the combination in general, the combination of bowel symptoms and urinary symptoms intuitively localizes us to the lower pelvis. When somebody has both constipation and urinary symptoms, that's where our mind is going. And I think people are asking the question, is there something there anatomic like constipation or prostate issues? And that's important, but you have to be careful as Aaron always teaches us of the possibility of false localization. And there are many ways you can have falsely localized um, uh, symptoms here. The first is that you actually have a systemic cause like hypercalcemia that causes constipation and urinary issues. That's one really important one. The other is that you actually have hyperglycemia causing your cloudy urine, and that um, is associated with diabetic constipation and you have a problem elsewhere. So what advice do I have to share? My advice here is don't think too hard. Trust your instinct that this localizes to the pelvis where the bladder and the rectum are located, but know that there are many ways you could be misled by systemic diseases like hyperglycemia and hypercalcemia. I'm curious, um, 
Francisca, if you have any uh, specific cultural things that come up here, specifically in Chile, it might not be. Um, constipation and cloudy urine are pretty universal. But there's, is there anything about being where you are that makes this presentation different or unique in some way? Mm, I think the, cows, the causes are the same, like yeah. all over the world. But this case in particular has uh, something interesting that we will be Ooh. revealing okay, <laughs> along right. the case. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, am, uh, I am intrigued. Tell us more, please. <laughs> Okay, so our patient is a very fragile man that lives on an elderly house. He was in his usual state of health until last week when he started with constipation. The la in the last two days, he evolved with anorexia, fatigue, foul smelling cloudy urine and somnolence. So the caregivers took him to the ER. I don't know if you want the medical history, past history. Yeah, why don't we get that since I rambled so much in the beginning. Okay, so 10 years ago, he had prostate cancer that was treated with surgery and radiation. He has also type 2, type two diabetes, hypertension, and atrial fibrillation without anticoagulation because of high risk of bleeding. He's also in a study for initial dementia. He had been hospitalized three times in the last two years because of pyelonephritis, secondary to bilateral urethiasis. Of his meds, well, he uses sertraline, risperidone, tamsulosine, and decapeptil every six months. He had no important family history. Uh, well, he lives on an elderly house as an important part of the social history, and he, have, he has no related health-related behavior, no allerg allergies either. Absolutely superb. Francisco, this is very, very uh, um, informative. I'm curious before we, I'll give the, I'll give the um, chat time to think about this case. I and instead will take advantage of your knowledge. Can you tell us what the sense in, uh, in Chile, how often are patients of this age living in, in elderly houses. Is there, in, in the United States, it's very, very common. Where I grew up in Lebanon, it's more common for families to absorb their older loved ones. What's this culture like in Chile? Yeah, it's also very common. Um, yeah. All, every, over the 80 years, yeah. most of our patients are institutional, are in elderly houses. And that is complex because, um, the treatment or the management of these patients is hard because we don't have many times the test the family history or his history. They have dementia. They don't they don't cooperate in the 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 anamnesis. So it's kind of hard to treat this type of patients. Yeah. Well, thank you for shedding light on that. I I don't think I had quite appreciated how. Um, how similar it is to uh, what the culture is like here in the United States. Um, yeah, they, they seem to be, so in some ways you're saying that culturally this is a very vulnerable patient because of um, their specific um, epidemiological exposure. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful, thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna scroll in the chat and I see that, um, uh, that Ravi has shared a really important thought for us to think about. Ravi, do you wanna unmute and share that thought? Sure, sure. I, I love the thought that uh, brilliant case, Francesca, by the way, you brilliantly uh, presented. Uh, uh, it's got us thinking, uh, like Robbie mentioned, focusing on the pelvis. So I was thinking anatomically, when you have a malignancy, there's always uh, infarcted tissue, inflamed tissue, which could uh, knock on a neighboring uh, structure like the, the, the uh, colon. And there could be a fistula formation. I've never seen it, but I was always intrigued by this pneumaturia business. Uh, I've yet to see it, but what if we're dealing, you know, this cloudy urine is a manifestation of stool in the urine. So just a thought there. I doubt it's probably going on with this patient, but it's always something to consider. Ravi, I think it's a superb thought, honestly. We had a, had a case on VMR maybe a year ago of a colovesicular fistula or fistula from the bladder um, to the urine causing um, a recurrent urinary tract infections. I think it's a wonderful thought. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Um, Shema has some thoughts about the possibility of malignancy. Shema, do you want to unmute and share them? Yeah, sure. Um, there was a discussion that maybe the um, 
as we talked about, the constipation could be triggered by a hypercalcemia. And as we know, where are some malignancies also related to hypercalcemia? And as I know, where are like these diseases related to lytic bone involvement, like, I don't know, multiple myeloma? Um, and um, I think like, because this person had prostate cancer, I rather don't think that if this person has relapsed, that this might cause hypercalcemia because prostate cancer makes osteoblastic metastases. That's why this was also a question from my side, yeah, about the possible hypercalcemia, if there is one. 100%. I think I love that connection with his medical history to a systemic disease. And I think the two systemic diseases that we originally thought of, right, we said, could there be a local disease process or could this person have hypercalcemia or hyperglycemia? And the calcemia now comes into focus because of the history of prostate cancer and the glucose comes into focus because of the history of diabetes. So I love this case because that's the power of clinical reasoning before. You think of these two things before you even get data to push you to think about them, further reinforcing that loop, which I think is always important. So Shema, I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I, will, um, I will share the other interesting dimension of this case is the fact that the patient has recurrent urinary tract infections. And I'm, um, I'm curious if we can call on our friends from uh, Concepcion. And I know um, Hernan has invited many people, Jose, Mitchell, Pablo, Paula, and many others. Any of you want to unmute and share what your thoughts would be if you were taking care of this patient in real time? No worries if, if not. I'll give you 30 seconds. I'd love a, from a friend, another friend from Chile to share their thoughts. I know uh, Chile is not known as the land of the shy based on the many friends that I have from Chile who are all very eloquent and poetic in general. Um, but I, I know we have our work cut out to welcome you more and more to VMR and convince you to save space. So I'll keep moving on and share my thoughts, but we'll continue to poke you should you feel more comfortable. Um, I'm going to share the screen real quick. Urinary tract infections is, is actually um, an oversimplification and something we should try to avoid. Instead, what we should try to do is as um, my very fluent English-speaking Francesca reminded us the patient doesn't have UTI, he has pilo, pyelonephritis. And so where along the urinary tract the patient is infected is important because the complications are different. Some, some people can get sick, some people don't, and the treatment duration is different, and the microbiology is different. For example, urethritis is usually STI. Pyelonephritis is usually granular virus. Here is what we're interested in right now. Why is this patient getting recurrent infections over and over and over again? And there's a list of about six things. The first is that you don't really know the patient has a short urethra. So um, it's more common in women than men who have shorter urethras. Prostate is already something, ooh, one second. My dog knocked over a very heavy pot. One second. I'm crazy, crazy, crazy. So in that moment of me rambling about urinary tract infections, my dog almost killed himself. But anyway, he's alive and well. Um, so idiopathic prostate disease, a neurogenic bladder. Ravi mentioned already a colovesicular fistula. You can actually compress your bladder from the outside too, and struvite stones. So this is something we have to wonder, why does this patient keep getting infections after infections after infections? And the odds are that it's the prostate as Rodrigue told us, but there are some less common causes to think about. The other more important one, in addition to prostate, is to think about stones. But as Ravi pointed out, the gastrointestinal history here has us worried about a colovesicular fistula. Any questions about that from anybody before we move on? Okay, all right. Francesca, you're up. <clears throat> Robbie, wait a minute. I did have one. Sorry. Um, hi, it's Drew. Um, quick question, and I just want to make sure that I heard this right. Francisca, 
I think you mentioned that his hospitalizations for Pilo in the last year were secondary to stone formation? Yes, that's true. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Thanks, thanks for that clarification. All right, Francesca, give, uh, Francesca, give us more, please. <clears throat> Moving on to his vitals. Well, he was in really bad conditions in the ER. His blood pressure was 84 over 60, heart rate 111, respiratory rate uh, 22, temperature 37.5 Celsius degrees, 92% O2 sat on room air. His general appearance, well, he was disoriented. He also presenting with lethargy, the dehydration and malnutrition. The physical exam, well, he had an irregular cardiac rhythm with conservative pulmonary exam. He had a distended abdomen, painful to palpation, depressible with no signs of peritoneal irritation, normal abdominal sounds. Do you want me to tell the, the last results? Uh, I appreciate you keeping an eye on the scribe and making sure that she's caught up. That is so yeah. wonderful and very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, why don't you give us the initial round of lab? Okay. His white blood cells count was, was 17.4, hemoglobin 11.9 with normal platelets account. Serum creatinine was 1.45. We don't know, we haven't another previously, so that's the only one we've got. Uremia was normal. Sodium was 150 with potassium 4.2 and chlorine 122. Venous gases got pH of 7.28 uh, with low bicarbonate. CRP was 6.2 and procalcitonin 0 0.59. The hearing analysis had abundant bacteria with more than 100 white blood cells with plaques of pus. Also, the prostate antigen was normal. Oh my gosh, I'm just so impressed with your English. It's absolutely superb. <laughs> you even changed the CRP to the way that it's said in English, which is... Uh, very, very thoughtful. Thank you so much. Um, I think the chat is really, really worried about this patient. Um, and my friend Ala is worried about bowel ischemia. Do you want to, uh, Ala, are you able to unmute and tell us more about how uh, you thought of that? It's a really, really good thought. Uh, yes. Uh, he has a history of atrial fiber addition. So uh, we have to think about bowel ischemia, uh, especially in old age. And yeah. uh, chronic bowel ischemia comes with uh, anorexia. Uh, he has a distended abdomen, painful to palpation. So that's my thought. I, excellent. Well, I couldn't agree more with you. Where are you calling from? I'm from Egypt. Egypt, welcome. Ahla sahla. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Tiago, your endocrine wisdom is shining through about the constellation that you have there. Do you want to unmute and share more, please? Hi, so <clears throat> I, I completely agree with the chat uh, that we should uh, take a look at his calcium because here there is constipation, anorexia, and uh, there are uh, nephrolithiasis. So hypercalcemia should um, be on the differential and the most common cause of hypercalcemia, it's primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, because, you know, uh, as we, as there are many people who are used to go to the hospital, uh, when you see hypercalcemia in the hospital, you think about cancer, multiple myeloma, but it does, that's not the most common cause. And uh, for this hypernatremia, I think it's not important uh, regarding diagnosis because it's very common to have hypernatremia if you don't have access to water. Uh, so for the elderly who, and he's disoriented, uh, so you know, it just happens because you don't have free water. And, and, and that's what means hypernatremia. Hypernatremia is less water in the vessel. And if he doesn't have access to water, it, it will not help us to progress in our differential diagnosis. I absolutely think that's superb. 
Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share um, a couple of uh, quick two pieces of advice. But beforehand, um, I would love for us to get some problem representations in all the language we have represented here. So um, Ernan, I'm going to ask you a favor and maybe ask you to identify one of your um, residents who can uh, share a problem representation in Spanish. Um, I'll ask my friend um, Marcela, who I believe is here. Yes, she's here. Do you want to share your problem representation in Portuguese? I'll, I'll prompt you all in a second. And then I think we have um, we have Shema here who, um, actually, I think Sammy's here too. Since I asked um, Shema to, sh uh, to talk earlier, I asked Sammy to share his problem representation um, in German if he can, but no worries if not. Um, so yeah, I'll come to you guys in a moment. Um, and But beforehand, we'll just share two pieces of practical advice. The first is that um, in a patient like this, he's breaking the rule. The rule is that most patients with urinary tract infections do not need imaging. He obeyed this rule beforehand, but he is breaking that rule now. Why? Because of how sick he is. A patient this ill with pyelonephritis with a urinary tract infection needs imaging. The only way you can avoid imaging is in a young, otherwise healthy female because the diagnosis you would be invoking then is uncomplicated but severe pyelonephritis because the risk factor for pylo would be progesterone mediated dilation of the ureter and that's why it got up there. In an older man, you can't have any uh, uh, diagnosis of exclusion like that. So this person needs CT imaging, period. Hypernatremia, just like Tiago, I completely agree with you and I wanted to share with you how I remember that. I remember the three A's. If I have one A, I don't need another explanation. And those A's are access, AMS, altered mental status, and very rarely adipsia. If a patient has two common A's or one rare A, I usually don't go searching for another less common cause like diabetes insipidus. So this patient has two of those A's. He probably has reduced access based where he lives and he has altered mental status, so I stop. But you get a urinalysis for free in this patient. And the only thing that would break my caution in two A's is to see if he has dilute urine. Dilute urine would be a very helpful clue to the presence of something unusual in this patient and would stop me from my assumption that it's one of the two A's. Alrighty, so um, Hernan, maybe I can come to you to see if uh, either you or any one of your residents can share a uh, problem representation in uh, Spanish. Yes, thank, thanks, Ravi. Eh, le quiero pedir a Mitchell, que lo veo ahí conectado, si nos puede hacer un pequeño resumen, una representación del problema en español eh, del caso. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm not very fluent in English, but I know I'm, I'm going to talk in Spanish. So thank you, Dr. Carrillo. Eh, bueno, estamos hablando de un adulto mayor de 76 años de edad frágil con aparentemente múltiples factores de riesgo cardiovascular que en este contexto ingresó por un cuadro de un compromiso de conciencia eh, además probablemente asociado a todos los antecedentes que presentaba de diabetes eh, una, un cáncer de próstata ya tratado y que en el contexto del cual está consultando actualmente muy probablemente está en una historia de un probable shock séptico a consecuencia de una infección del tracto urinario complicada. Michelle, it's so nice to meet you. And um, you speak Spanish so deliberately that I was able to, to hear the components. I've learned a lot from Maria Valle um, and many others over the last year or so. Um, Mitchell, where where is home for you? Where what part of Chile is home? I am from Concepcion too, uh, oh, Concepcion. same as Francisca. Amazing! I'm noticing that you all think your English is not good, but it's much better than what you think it is. Yes, but I need to to feel more confident to yes. to to speak, yes. and it's, and I think that it's very uh, difficult for us trying to to understand because yes. many times uh, you speak very quickly, and so. We are trying to think in the clinical case and try to translate to Spanish. So it's a little difficult for us to, to feel confident. Yeah, I know. Um, but I think that, that the next time, if you if you invite us, uh, we, we can speak uh, more. Yeah. You know, you're doing so much more work than I am. Your mind is has a whole extra translate 
part that I don't have to do. And that, <laughs> yes, it takes a lot of time and it also reduces your confidence for sure. Um, but it's so nice to um, get to know you and for, to hear your voice, even, even if it's for a small period of time. Thank you for, for joining us. You're welcome. Of course. All righty. Um, maybe we'll come to Portuguese next and have Marcela share her problem representation. Sure. Thank you, Javi. So we have um, um homem, 75 anos, apresenta-se com oito dias de constipação intestinal, anorexia e urina turva. Tem uma história pregressa de câncer de próstata, tratado com quimioterapia e radioterapia, diabetes, fibrilação atrial e pélonefrite de repetição. No exame físico, apresenta alteração dos sinais vitais sugestivas de sepsi, e exames laboratoriais com aumento da creatinina, hipernatremia e acidose metabólica. That's it. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Maybe I'll come to you, Sammy, if you're able to unmute. If not, I saw that Shema has a problem representation in the chat, and we'll use hers. Okay, I think Sammy might be um, otherwise occupied. All right, Shema, do you want to share yours out loud, if you don't mind? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, ah, yeah. Ein 76-jähriger äh, Patient vorstelle ich äh, mit vorherigen guten AZ. Äh, oh, sorry, I'm completely out again. <lacht> 76-jähriger äh, mit äh, vormals gutem AZ ist vorstelle ich mit seit acht Tagen bestehender Obstipation, trüben Urin und Anorexie und ist aktuell somnolent. Okay, now I have it. Nice, amazing. Um, and maybe I'll do one last uh, ditch attempt for another language. Ala, I, I, uh, my friend from Egypt, I'm not sure if you're able to share how you would think about this case in Arabic. If not, no problem at all. Okay, I think we'll have to pass on Arabic this time, uh, but maybe next time. All righty, my friend Francisca, back to you to take us. Oh, yes, if you can, I'll, I'll give you a minute to prepare it. And then maybe you can share a problem representation in Arabic. Alrighty, maybe Francisca, you can give us the next aliquot and then we'll come to Ala if he's <clears throat> ready to share a problem representation at the next aliquot. Okay. I forgot to say that glycemia was normal. And um, okay, he had an abdominal CT that shows bilateral hydroureteral nephrosis with lithiasis in the left proximal heuristoral sterile and intravesical lithiasis in the right posterior lateral wall. Also, CT shows perirenal edema and a rectal fecaloma. Well, he was treated as in the ER as with the sepsis protocol with fluid reanimation and antibiotics, thinking in acute PLO, achieving stabilization of blood pressure. Patient was also evaluated by urology and had installed a bilateral WJ catheter to maintain a patent uh, urinary tract while the infection was treated. But here comes the interesting part of the story. Once our patient was um, compensated and hydrated, he persisted with tendons to constipation. So we did the calcium metabolism study and albumin corrected calcium was on 13. Further studies were requested. He had hypercalciuria, phosphorus in 1.6, DG vitamin 12, Paratormone 549 and calcium steel 13. Oi, oi, oi. You are giving me goosebumps with this case. <laughs> um, but I, I think part, a big part of um, this community is bringing in people from all over the world with varying levels of expertise from the person who is just starting their first year medical school to the person who is a full expert. So um, I will pass the mic to Tiago to share his wonderful teaching of this topic since he's literally a world expert. But before we go to Tiago, maybe I can see if Allah is ready for a problem representation in Arabic. If not, no problem at all. Uh, I am not very fluent in uh... Arabic, of course, Arabic. Uh, actually, I'm uh, fluent in Egyptian Arabic. So oh, yeah. I... Do it, please. 
سو uh, so, uh, 76 سنة راجل جاي uh, بقاله 8 سنين بإمساك وبول غامق أو معكر uh, وفقدان في الشهية uh, هي, uh, هو كان uh, صحيح بقاله uh, أسبوعين uh, بس من يومين فقد الشهية والبول uh, بقى معكر وريحته uh, مش كويسة That's it. I understood most of that, my friend. That was really good. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. From Arabic to from Egypt to Brazil for um, Tiago's master class on Africa. Senior, I'll let you uh, take it home, Tiago. You are so so kind, Rabi. Uh, I, I think that's not so much a discuss here because they saw the hypercalcemia. When you see hypercalcemia and the phosphorus is low, so you suppose it's PGH. And I think that the, the, the most important thing to know is that when you see hypercalcemia, just uh, measure PGH. If PGH is high, then it's primary hyperparathyroidism. It doesn't matter the rest because you, know, you can have CKD and primary hyperparathyroidism because CKD can cause secondary hyperparathyroidism, but in this case, calcium will not be high. So if you, for some reason, you you change your PGA just to keep the balance, then the cal there is no hypercompensation. So if you have CKD, uh, then your calcium tend to be low. And then for this reason, the, the parathyroids, they will read that the calcium tend to be low. They will increase PGA, but there is no supercompensation. Calcium will not be high. Okay, they, there is a tertiary hyperparathyroidism, but okay, forget it by now. Uh, there is no supercompensation. So if you have high calcium, high PTH, there is no other diagnosis. It's primary hyperparathyroidism. There is no other situation. It doesn't matter the vitamin D, it doesn't matter the creatinine. Uh, you know, again, there is a tertiary hyperpara, but forget it now. Uh, and uh, here, I, I think that, the, so there is an indication for surgery because another thing you have to take into consideration if, if there is an indication for surgery, uh, I don't know if Francesca is going to talk about it, uh, Francesca, uh, about indications for surgery, but in this case, there is an indication for surgery, which is the nephrolithiasis. Uh, and then you have to, as always in endocrine, you have a diagnosis, which is biochemical, the primary hyperparathyroidism, and now you have to localize the disease because we have four glands. And uh, most of the case of primary hyperparathyroidism, it's an adenoma. Here on Cipsover, Scanu presented a case of a carcinoma actually a few weeks ago, which is very rare. And we also can have like hyperplasia, like multiple glands affected, but uh, over 90% of the case, it will be an adenoma. Also, I had a case actually once that uh, the gland was ectopic. So in the past, we didn't uh, do image in the past. So I, I didn't see this, this, this epoch, but in the past they didn't do image. And so they just opened the, 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 the neck and they were looking for the gland affected. But now with these images, it's much better because you can identify maybe if it's ectopic, then you can find it. And I had one case in which it was ectopic and then the surgeon could uh, go to the correct place. So, uh, and you can use different images like um, MRI, ultrasound, scintigraphy, uh, all of those. And uh, that's it. I talk too much. Sorry about it. Oh, impossible. The day you talk too much is the day the world is over, my friend. Um, that is, uh, we are seeing Kanu share some statistics in the chat and Sammy um, share his personal experience uh, on his uh, endocrine surgery rotation now. Um, I think because it's important, we're trying to uh, get to know our friends from Chile a little bit better. I'll just share one tip and then um, pass the mic to my friend Francisca there um, uh, to summarize the case and her learning, and then um, to Maria to guide us through our uh, reflections about uh, the global nature of this gathering. And my advice is, I think this patient would have broken the 2A rule. So remember when I shared with you hypernatremia, think 2As, but look at the urinalysis for the concentration of urine. So this patient has two A's. He's altered and has no access to water or reduced access to water. But I suspect that his urine specific gravity would have been low. 
The reason that is, the reason he's so hypernatremic is because he probably with this degree of calcium has hypercalcemia induced nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And so as all of us strive to improve every single case, I think if you go back and you see, oh, his specific gravity, his urine concentration is very low. Why? You might have picked up the hypercalcemia right then and there. But, but if you pretend like every single case you did it perfectly and there's no room for improvement, you're missing out. Is it realistic to look at the specific gravity for every patient? No, no, not at all. But maybe if you see, oh, history of kidney stones and hypernatremia, you might think about it then. So my advice is the lesson from this case shouldn't be, oh, look at the specific gravity in every patient. But hey, if you have kidney stones and you have hypernatremia, maybe the connection is hypercalcemia causing secondary, uh, causing nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So I don't know, Francisca, if you have that information, it might, you may not have it because it didn't come up before and that's okay. Um, and what you took care, how this patient did, what did you learn from this case? Okay. Well, I met this patient when he was um, compensated, when he was like hospitalized in the um, internal medicine service. So yeah, we we sat down and we thought about like looking back, like when with the patient with uh, normal vital signs is different. So uh, what did I learn from this case is that when you have a patient that has the story of kidney stones, you should at least study them once, just to be sure that why, why is he making kidney stones? Because he has been hospitalized three times before, it's very critical, he could have died from septic shock. And we have the diagnosis before. It was a, a really beautiful case to treat. It was uh, nice to present here with you guys. Um, Francisca, you taught us so much. One, I think, to um, especially in light of what Mitchell reminded us of how hard it is to learn medicine in a different language, speak a different language all the time, and come here in an international with 50 live people, many other people who will listen afterwards and um, present the way you did is amazing. I really, really think that, um, that what you've done today is a very, very hard task, way harder than anything I've had to do today. So I'm very impressed. Um, I will beg you never to ask me to come and present a case to you in Spanish because I will fail miserably. Um, and so I'm especially grateful um, to you uh, for coming today. And, and the medical part of this case is amazing. Um, just the medicine alone, you taught us some very specific um, cultural things within Chile about the nature of this patient and where he lives and what that, uh, what that is in general in Chile, but also some things that transcend medicine globally, which is when you have urinary and pelvic issues, think immediately something right there. But two systemic causes, hyperglycemia and hypercalcemia. And today you brought hypercalcemia to reinforce that point. I'm very, very grateful for it. Um, I'll pass the mic to uh, my friend Hernan, who I know knows this case for any of his reflections in English or Spanish. And then to Maria to guide us through our Q&A. Thank you, Ravi. Yes, this case seemed important for us for several things. The first, the first thing is that it is an institutionalized elderly, which is common in our country, as you said before. Furthermore, up to 10% of our hospital beds are occupied by people who stay in the hospital because they have no home to go. And I, I think this would be a reality in all Latin American hospitals and all, of the, all over the world. And the second is to ask the why. In this case, his history of multiple hospitalization is resolved by getting to the bottom of the diagnosis, which was to ask ourselves why he was having this recurrent uh, pyelonephritis. So it was a very beautiful case. And Francisca, it's, she's a very wonderful student. She's a 
master clinician for us. So we are very happy. I uh, I will reinforce that. I think she I think she's a master clinician globally now. Alrighty, Maria, mic to you, my friend. Ay, sí, bueno, voy a hablar un poquito en español. Gracias, Francisca y Hernán. El caso estuvo increíble y la verdad es que eh, aprendí muchísimo de todos ustedes. Uh, for everybody in the, in, in, in the VMR, if you have any questions for them, you can put them in the chat and we'll try to feature as, much question, as many questions as we can. I have to start with food first. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll just open it up for anybody, Hernan, maybe you can uh, ask one of your residents. If we go to Chile and if we go to Concepcion, like what is, what would have to be the food we couldn't leave without trying? Ooh, good question. <laughs> uh, I would like to Pablo Lara, who, if you can tell us what food uh, can we recommend? ¿Qué comida podemos recomendar de aquí de Concepción? Um, um, I think Chilean wine first of all. Um, of course, we, if we go to Talcahuano, we have uh, great, great fishes. So, uh, sea, sea plates are great in general. And of course, empanadas are typical Chilean food. I would say that. <laughs> That's awesome. I heard like a lot of fish. I'm trying to be a pescatarian, so I definitely uh, need to go and try all of the fish I can. Uh, I think Ravi, Dr. Singh, has uh, a really good question that maybe Hernan can answer. Uh, Dr. Singh, would you want to uh, open your mic? Oh, yes. It's uh, it's great to see the program here today. I just love it. Uh, we probably haven't had in a, a group from Chile before, but I just had a question like, what kind of program-led activities do you, do you like to do with your trainees to inspire them and also uh, have a, develop a team-based approach to your program? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, in the program, we have uh, three major hospitals uh, in which we form our professionals. And one is uh, La Figueras Hospital. And we, had, we have this vision about internal medicine that has three main uh, key points. One of which is a diagnostic process. And we are really obsessed with this and uh, finding CP solvers was like uh, very beautiful because it was finding people that love uh, clinical reasoning just as us. And the key for a good clinician is to care about resolving the problem of the person in front of you. You have to study, you have to know the, the clinical issues, but you have to care about resolving the problem. That is the one motor that moves you around diagnostic process. So we are uh, very motivated to uh, transfer that to our students that uh, you have to love and care human being in front of you. And you have to realize the social reality of our patients, uh, that it's a very poor environment. And we had a social a key role that we have to accomplish. So that is the fundamentals of our program. That is awesome. Um, you know, even through Met Twitter, we've heard a lot of your uh, clinical reasoning, um, you know, all of the activities you're doing and you're really motivating clinical reasoning culture worldwide. So. Oh, that is awesome. We are very proud to have you here, Hernan. And like, esta es tu segunda casa cuando, cuando quieras. Yeah. <laughs> Marce, do you have a question for them as well? Yeah, you asked about the food and I'm really curious to know which place should we visit? Like, what are your favorite place you visit there? Yeah, we have a lot of beach here. So we, we are very in the sea and we have also snow. 
So if you want to ski, it's a good place to be. And uh, we have a lot of lands. So there is a like a um, country culture that is very rich. We have all, all kinds of lands here in Concepcion. It's very beautiful. I love it. Awesome. I'll have to Google everything. And I think, uh, Paula, I think you're also from the program. Do you want to open your mic? Y tal, y pues nos puedes hablar en inglés o en español y pues compartirnos cuál es tu lugar favorito. Eh, hola, voy a hablar en español. Oh, no, no. Eh, eh, depende en verdad si les gusta más el calor o el frío o la montaña o el mar, porque Chile tiene mucho, muchos territorios lindos que conocer. Si les gusta el norte, yo recomiendo San Pedro de Atacama. Eh, tiene salares, tiene volcanes, tiene mucha flora y fauna. Eh, y harta comida típica de la zona norte. Y en el sur, les comenté ahí eh, Torres del Paine. Es un, un parque nacional. Se puede hacer trekking. Eh, trekking, eh, trekking corto o paseos cortos o más bien de varios días y también es algo bien distintivo de Chile y bonito I love it I've always been like very eh, gracias Paula eh, I've always been like really interested because Chile is such a long country you must have like you know if you like beaches you have beaches if you like mountains you have mountains if you like cities I bet you have um, amazing cities And, and then, um, you know, I don't think we could invite Chile and not talk about soccer. <laughs> so, uh, Jasmian, uh, do you want to open your mic and ask your question? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, actually, I'm from India. So in India, uh, we do have like football leagues, but majority of the Indians, they are like follow Premier League, Bundesliga, League One. So the major leagues of European countries. But I know the South American, all the countries, they have their individual leagues and the football culture is very rich there. So just I wanted to ask about Chile, like how is the culture there? Yes, we have a very soccer culture and um, we have a very great uh, players like Alexis Sanchez. No sé, los chicos me pueden ayudar acá. Zamorano, Sala. De la antigua escuela, yes, uh, of the old school. Yeah. I can share another name, Arturo Vidal, Alexis Sanchez, Claudio Bravo. Uh, the Chilean uh, team uh, was a uh, champion of two Cups Amer America, America's Cup. Uh, so we are very passionate with our, with our team. And we have a local, local league, the Primera División. And one of the most um, important uh, teams is Colo Colo and Universidad de Chile. The Clásico of Chile is uh, that match, Colo Colo against uh, Universidad de Chile. Oh. And for Paulo Merino, is for Paulo Merino that is connected over there, we have to name a <laughs> Fernandez Vial, yes. the team. <laughs> that is awesome. I am not going to pretend I know about soccer. But I really like to watch it just because it's exciting, but um, I'll Google those too. <laughs> and maybe, Hernan, you can ask uh, any of your uh, residents. I know that Sebastian Ramirez is also here and that he's done a lot of great um, schemas and illness script. Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, certain diseases or prevalence of diseases that are special or unique to Chile. Yes, thank you. Uh, Sebastian is connected over there. And with him, we work on a myocarditis uh, schema that we share with you. And uh, um, here in Chile, we, we see a lot of TB, tuberculosis. We see a lot of typhoid fever. Uh, that is uh, one of the, it can be sometimes difficult to diagnose. Um, and I would like to Sebastian to comment a little bit about his experience uh, when we made that uh, schema. Sebastian. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, I'm Sebastian. I'm not resident uh, in the moment. Uh, I would like to be resident uh, of internal medicine, obviously. 
um, will participate with CP Solves and create a schema of myocarditis with a great experience. Um, I performed in, in, the, um, in the area of cardiology and in the area of uh, infectious disease, autoimmune disease, toxicology, for understand how uh, myocarditis occurs. And I review a lot of papers of so many consensus uh, of uh, our society, uh, uh, scientific societies. And it was a really good experience to review the pathology and understand and systematize the information to understand uh, how we can treat better this patient and recognize the, the pathology. Because myocarditis is not often common, but could be a really, um, a really dangerous disease. And uh, was a real experience. Was a really good experience. I'm so grateful of my professor Enan and and Hospital Las Higueras. Gracias, Sebastián. Uh, and I just put in the chat our Spanish. Uh, website. Um, oh, and then like Hernan has a surprise for us. Maybe Hernan, uh, you can tell us a little bit about you, what you prepared for us. Yes, uh, a resident prepare an illness script of uh, hyperparathyroidism. Uh, so we want to share it with you, but I can't. Uh, I can't send it through the chat. I don't know why, uh, but I can send it to you, and maybe you can share it after. Awesome. Uh, we'll post it on the website to, tonight uh, when we post like the video and everything. And if we don't have any more questions, I'll let you off uh, and to enjoy your Saturday. I just want to uh, really, I, I, I just want to tell you that I really appreciate all of you being here, sharing a little bit about you, medicine, your family, soccer, food, uh, and places to visit. It really warms my heart. Uh, and It was, a, it was really a pleasure to have all of you here. Eh, también lo voy a decir en español. Gracias a todos por venir y acompañarnos. Eh, me encantó pasarla con ustedes. Aprendí muchísimo y también aprendí mucho, pues, un poquito de chile. Eh, así me reciben <laughs> cuando vaya. Um, I don't know, if Robbie, uh, do you want to have any final words? Um, folks, uh, we still have 42 people left here, even though we're late. I just wanted to um, say, two, say two things. One is, Um, Hernan, your um, kiddo is so cute and energetic and full of life. Um, just like yeah. you, I bet, I bet she's going to grow up to be a great singer. I didn't say doctor because um, no pressure, you know, uh, um, we're really delighted to have you join us and be the first program to be featured here. Uh, I think it's so fitting, um, with how much we've gone to know each other over the last year or so. Um, but I think all of you should really know, um, that um, some very, very rare, very rarely is credit credit so concentrated. And today it's very concentrated in, on the person, the only person here who doesn't have their name um, and is calling themselves the clinical problem solvers instead of their name because she's hiding under her, uh, diluting her contribution. This, this is single-handedly happening because of Maria today. Um, and her vision to bring all the CP solvers people behind her to do this work is absolutely incredible. And I think what she um, symbolizes is our deep commitment to bringing all of us together so we can get to know each other better, make, make the world a smaller place and take better care of our patients. That's ultimately what we're uh, hoping. So the 41 of you, well, actually 40 of you, because Maria can't thank herself because she's too humble. Um, really, uh, whether or not you realize it, what a debt of gratitude to Hernan and his um, uh, program. Um, And a special shout out to uh, Francisca for presenting the case and also to Maria for making it happen. I'm really sad that she didn't share the most embarrassing story I've ever heard of um, because she was so nervous yesterday. She was texting me. She was so nervous about making sure that all of you here felt welcome, respected, heard, um, and your culture shown through that she told me one very, very embarrassing story, which I will hold her to maybe in the near future. So someday, Hernan, I hope you will sing And Maria will tell us the most embarrassing story ever. Maybe in maybe next time. All right. Bye. Only like next time. Then we, Hernan has to come back. Exactly. Um, <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. Muchas, muchas gracias.